Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to In Their Own Words, Demythifying Asian Americans, uh, a conversation between artists and educators. Ji Woo Kim, raise your hand, Ji Woo. Hi. Uh, Yin Min Wong, Aya Rodriguez Izumi, and Dr. Catherine Rosamond, is our moderator. Uh, this is uh, presented by MFA Fine Arts in collaboration with uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion run by Brendan Fortune over there. Uh, thank you so much. Let the ladies take it away. First, we should introduce ourselves. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Yin. I was a student here last year. I graduated last year. And a little bit about my immigration background. I was born and raised here in America, specifically in Michigan and Ohio. And then my parents are immigrants from China, and they came here in the mid-80s and settled here first for a couple of years and then moved out to the West. And yeah, so I'm, sec I'm first generation educated here, but I'm second generation in terms of immigrants. Um, and most of my work is about that in the sense that I am kind of just using painting as a way to explore how I fit socially and culturally in any space. And I focus a little bit more on language and nostalgia in terms of like my vehicle, my conceptual vehicle to talk about these things. And yeah, that's just a really brief intro about me. Um, I'm Ji Wu, and I also graduated in May with Yin. Um, I consider myself a 1.5 generation immigrant, which basically means that I moved here during my formative years. I was born in South Korea, and then I think I immigrated to Canada when I was four or five. Um, and then, so I'm not Asian American, but I, let's say Asian North American. <laughs> um, and yeah, I make oil paintings, figurative paintings that talk about the sense of belonging or a community that I never had when I was growing up because I was always in between cultures, in between languages, in between communities. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Hey everybody, my name is Aya. I'm on faculty here. I also graduated from SVA MFA in 2017. I was born in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, my mom is Okinawan, my dad is Puerto Rican and Cuban. I guess I'm a first, second, and third generation immigrant. Um, so it's a little bit complicated. Um, I was born there, grew up between New York and Okinawa, so kind of always like living on an island. Um, and yeah, a lot of my work has to do with with my background and excited to be in this conversation with everybody today. Hi, my name is um, Kathy Rosamond. I'm the chair of the art education department here at SVA. I, um, my work is, uh, I'm an artist educator mostly right now. I'm writing, I'm presenting um, a lot of decolonial perspectives. And um, I was invited here as a facilitator Thank you um, for inviting me. I'm also part of the, I was part of the DEI task force here at SVA for several years. Um, and uh, also in a DEI sort of uh, commissioner on a national level at National Art Educators Association. I was born in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, my father was Portuguese Japanese. My mother is Japanese. Uh, I grew up there. Um, I also moved to Canada as a teenager uh, and then sort of came to college here. So I did not know about 1.5, so maybe that's what I am. Um, I haven't been back to Japan in some time because after my father passed 12, 13 years ago, um, I don't need to go back because I don't have a home there anymore. Um, yeah, that's kind of my background. And hopefully through conversations, um, you'll get to know us a little bit better. And um, yeah, so let's just. Directors. 
to start us off. To start us off, we wanted to pose a question to just kind of get you going. And it's how do you understand or perceive Asian American and or Asian identity in America? We wanted to focus specifically on America because what we wanted to talk about today was mostly the model minority myth and that was coined in America and is most prevalent here. You might hear it in the Western world in general when you're talking about Asian American identity, but it's mostly in American context that we are experiencing it and we can talk about it in this space. But how do we, what do we, what do we? <laughs> I don't know what we're about. So we want you to think about this question. Uh, you might want to talk to your neighbors about it. Uh, just like a small discussion. How do you, maybe some of you have an understanding better than others in terms of the, even the model minority myth or the Asian American identity. We also have uh, this sheet that you all got. We want you to spend a few minutes. Um, if you didn't, we can pass it back. Yeah. Uh, does everyone have one of these? And some of, you know, for some of you, this might be really um, a basic uh, definition, but some of you might be new and it really doesn't matter your level of knowledge, but we just want you to familiarize because we're going to be using some of these words so you sort of understand um, what BIPOC, uh, AAPI, cultural assimilation, microaggression, code switching, model minority. Um, the QR codes are more for you later on. There's some readings that, if that you might be interested in. There's some good articles um, in the New Yorker and a chart um, that shows like more uh, facts and about the population of Asian Americans from, I think it's 2021. And then a book um, called The Model Minority, um, where the model minority definition is pulled from this book um, called Racial Melancholia. Um, it's, a, it's a really good book. Um, so really, really few selected ones. Um, there's obviously more resources, uh, but just a starter, please, yeah, think about this question, talk, to your neighbors, um, and we'll give you a few minutes to read the definitions as well. Maybe we'll just spend like two minutes on that, and it's um, and we can circle back to that question, have a share out in the end when we have a Q and A too. Great. Okay, um, so it's going to be a question and some answers. It'll be more conversational. Hopefully, um, you'll learn something from the conversation. Note some things that you might want to ask later, or just comment later regarding the first question you saw or something um, related to our conversation. So I'm just going to start with, um, did you grow up with parents, caregivers, or other AAPI relatives who believed in assimilation as the key to success in America? Um, if so, how has the notion of assimilation shaped who you are today or influenced the work of art that you produce? Who wants to answer that? Um, yeah, I think this is a question that Yin and I have talked about quite a lot privately because of the difference in her being a second gener generation immigrant and then me being 1.5. Um, and I was reading recently, I think it was in, actually I don't remember which book it was in, but they were basically saying second generation immigrants tend to be like really proud of their Asian identity. They want to like reclaim that. And they're all about like being loud and like, you know, talking about the problems that exist for AAPI communities. And then I think first generation immigrants, like their parents are always telling them like, you know, like maybe my parents weren't like this, but <laughs> maybe like speak um, English even at home to further enhance like your language skills. And like, I think what I did here growing up um, was even now like me being in New York City by myself without my family, my family's always saying um, like, just be careful. Like they know that I have quite a temper. <laughs> so they're like, just don't do anything that would put yourself in danger. Like put your head down, like work hard, 
it's kind of like silencing me sometimes, I guess, just because of safety and like their worry in me being here as a foreigner or like perceived as a foreigner. Yeah, my experience was also different just because I was in a town that had me, my family and like one other Asian family. So I had less of a focus on assimilating in the sense that I was trying to become one of them because very obviously that's impossible. It was more like, how can I make myself take up less space in their head that's out of my control? And so my parents were focused on letting me know that I should be aware of who I am culturally and like I was raised where the second I went home, the second I arrived at home, I would be speaking Chinese and I would be addressing my parents in the way that they want me to address them. And like, it's just very cut and clear where I was when I was at home and where I was when I stepped out of my house. And weirdly, I think I benefited a lot from that because I didn't have to alter as much of myself when my environment became more like ambiguous in terms of culture and social norms. So I almost was able to not worry so much about fitting in as much as my other Asian American counterparts in that area probably because my parents were less worried about other people's thoughts about them and more about me and how I understand them if that makes sense. So it was less about assimilating and more just about being comfortable with myself. But weirdly enough, I can say with a lot of confidence that I have two older brothers and they are four and six years apart from me. And they think very differently about being Asian American than I do. And it's really interesting because we're raised in the same household, following the same like house rules and shit. Well, sorry, am I, am I okay? Um, but <laughs> uh, they have a very different relationship with how they feel Chinese or how they feel American than I do, partly also because they are men. But just in general, I think I am still thinking about how to answer this question just because I'm still living this question and I'll pass on the mic for now because <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. But... Did you have a comment? Yeah, sure. About assimilation. Um, I guess a lot of my relationship with my Asian identity is really about being Okinawan. And um, there was the idea of assimilation was something that for a long time was um, pushed by the government in Okinawa as a way of assimilating Okinawa to be more like mainland Japan. So things like language, things like cultural practice, um, things like religion were something that at one point were outlawed in Okinawa. And it's just now something that I feel like is kind of starting to come back um, and it's something that I guess my parents have always been people who really held on to their own traditions and um, really kind of focused on the heritage that they brought from their, from their family that had immigrated to different kind of places. Um, so I've always kind of been brought up in that tradition of really intentionally being aware of what you're doing and why and what that means, because at a certain point, you know, you couldn't um, you couldn't celebrate those things, and at a certain point, they were like at risk of disappearing. Um, so, so yeah, it's the idea of assimilation is tough, and I feel like maybe I was there was more of a pressure of that for me in Asia than in the United States, actually. 
super interesting. Um, I never thought about it, but because when you grow up in Japan with a foreign name and a foreign father, you are a foreigner. So when you come here, they're like, oh, you're Japanese. But it's like, well, in Japan, they didn't treat me like Japanese. I'm not yeah. sore about it, but it's just you're different. You're an outsider forever. Um, kids didn't want to play with my me and my sister. We went to a different school. We got school bus like hour and a half away because we had to go to an English speaking school because we just didn't belong to a Japanese school. So um, it's it's really interesting. Like, yeah, the assimilation is maybe more where we come from for us than here. Um, um, yeah. I know what um, you mean about the language, too. I don't know how y'all feel about it. I know, Yin, you spoke a little bit about language, like inside and outside of the home, and that being such kind of like a signifier of things to, to people, too. Um, but, but yeah, also kind of like sometimes not being able to speak a language, like maybe that is also kind of a, a thing that... Um, maybe also kind of deals with this other topic that's also on this sheet of code switching mm -hmm. um, that I know is something that's a big topic in maybe both of your works in ways. Yeah, um, so yeah, so let's talk about code switching. Uh, if you're not familiar, there's a, defi a brief definition there, but the definition of code switching often centers around two languages, switching between two languages or dialects, but for those who code switch, um, often it's more than navigating two languages. Um, can you speak a little bit more about code switching based on your experiences and your lives? Um, also kind of going off what Aya said earlier about language, but, uh, and the last question, mm -hmm. but my parents in terms of assimilation, I feel like they weren't so straightforward about what they, expected in terms of belonging to America or like fitting into America was because they had such a hard time with the language. And at one point, I honestly think that my dad gave up because at this point in his life, after being in America for like 30 something years, he still doesn't know his own address. He still doesn't really know how to write our entire family's English names. And somehow he has survived and thrived for the past 30 years doing that. And so I just think that it's hilarious. But in terms of code switching, I this is actually like the huge a huge focus in my work because I have always thought it was really interesting how I see a very obvious shift in myself when I am speaking Chinese and when I'm speaking English. And I also see a huge shift depending on who I'm speaking to. And I think all of that comes with this need to be understood and fear for being misunderstood that all like migrants feel and so literally everyone in this room code switches it's not just about two different languages it's about two different attitudes almost or perceived reality surrounding the person so like if you're in this room, you're going to speak a certain way. But when you're outside having a smoke break, you're speaking a different way, too. That in itself is also code switching, you're moving between two different types of mental spaces as well. And so I just. I think Asian Americans in particular might be. A little more like there's a lot of labor in it for I think Asians because of how different the languages are and how different the culture attached to the languages are. So I am probably gonna be painting about it for the rest of my life because there's just so much to be said about it. <laughs> but, uh... Um, code switching for me, yeah, I mean, I think a lot about language like, because my fluency levels in Korean and English, I think, are pretty much the same. Um, I was telling Ian right before this started, like, this is my first time speaking English, like, like outside of our meeting recently for, I think, like, a good month or so. And so preparing for this largely was me, like, 
not listening and not consuming to Korean media because I was like, I got to hone in on my English skills. Um, and I've noticed that like my personality completely changes when I speak English and Korean. Um, and I think that has to do with the fact that growing up, like in, I spoke Korean at home and the English outside. So English for me was always a language that I had to like defend myself in and be really um, like aggressive almost because I was always like on guard and there's this like alertness that you have when you're growing up as like, and when I first immigrated to Canada, I was in a really predominantly white neighborhood. And if you are like me, where you like grew up in that environment, you know that kids can be really nasty. They can be really racist. <laughs> so um, I think like English for me, it's always been like, it's been more of like a authoritative thing. It, um, whereas Korean, I feel much more comfortable speaking about like my emotions in that language. Even when it's like reading, I read like analyses and like articles in English and then I prefer to read poetry and like fiction in Korean. Same thing with writing, like I'll write notes to myself like to-do lists in English and then write like journaling I'll do in Korean. It's a very much like, yeah, there was like a big difference for me when it comes to languages and I think like even in behaviors because um, I don't mean to be like divisive, but after I like graduated high school, I realized that like all my, most of my social conflicts had been with like Asians from Asia. And I think it's because um, there's just like a, a cultural gap between Asian Americans and Asians, if I'm speaking really candidly. And so even when I like interact with Koreans, I think like I still have like my guard up in a way where I'm like, in English, I don't have a filter. In Korean, I like filter things like twice, like three times, four times, because I'm like, is there a possibility that this could come off in a way where I'm perceived as like rude or individualistic? Um, things that like kind of go against that Asian culture of like community, like, like let's help one another, that type of thing. Can I ask um, maybe a different question that's not on our, our sheet? I know, taking it off road here. Well, thinking about assimilation and code switching, do you ever kind of think of maybe the idea of code switching is also like a form of survival or a form of protection too? Yeah, I'd like to, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I'd be curious of like, oh, how, I don't know, I know that for me, definitely in different environments, it is, it's like you have to kind of um, blend in in a certain way, you know? And I think in certain times, it's also, you know, people who are maybe perceived as other, um, you have to, you have to code switch. Um, and it's a thing that maybe like Yin said, something that we all do, um, but yeah, I'm kind of curious about that for y'all's experiences. I think in terms of survival, yes, because a lot of times you almost have to s speak the way that the majority speaks to even be perceived to be in that room. So, to not speak someone's language is to kind of separate yourself, but to not speak at all is to just remove yourself from the possibility of being there. And so as a minority, you have to put yourself out there and learn that language to be even considered in that space. And so, yes, very much a survival skill for a lot of people who code switch in specific ways but I also think it's, it becomes, it's kind of a double-edged sword, is that how you use that word? But like, we are both doing it for survival, but then we're also, or at least I think I am, more apt in a wider range of social situations than 
what I perceive my counterparts who don't speak as many languages or don't have to navigate as many obstacles or conflicts on a daily basis. So while it's like a, a, la a laborious thing, it's also kind of a game eventually because you start registering where you are and how you can behave and how you can speak to thrive in the space that you previously were ignored. So it's like a whole process beyond just surviving, in my opinion. Want to add anything to it before? Um, I think I sort of echo that sentiment. I mean, it's a definite survival tactic for me. I'm being a little shy right now, but like usually like, <laughs> I, I don't talk this nicely, basically. Um, and even when I was in the program, I've had several white male students tell me I have a fire in the way that I speak, which I thought was hilarious. But I'm like, yeah, that's true. I'm glad you perceive me that way because I'm like, I don't want to come off as being like this docile little thing to white men because I don't want to give them more power than they already have. Um, but yeah, definite survival tactic. So that's a little bit about like stereotypes and model minority myth. We can move into that. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard the model minority myth. Um, just, you know, Asians follow rule, rule followers, polite, quiet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how has the model minority myth harmed you as an Asian American living in the U.S.? And then I'm just going to also add, how have you benefited from the model minority myth? So the model minority myth is like a huge, it's a huge definition, but I think the main thing that people take away from it is just that Asian people won't push back in any way negative or positive. So like we will just be subjected to whatever is happening to us. And so a lot of times I think I just am told things that I don't need to be told or like am people share their feelings about me that I don't need to know and that they don't need to have mm -hmm. because they think I'll just take it because I'm an Asian <laughs> I'm an Asian person who is here to work and make money and do my job and be quiet and excel off to the side. And that becomes like the only way that Asian people are perceived. But then at the same time, that is, it becomes kind of a benefit because we are perceived as a model citizen and we, excel over other people or we we are even though we started from a place of being a minority we have somehow found success through economic or academic means and that sounds like a really good reputation to have but then as soon as you don't fit into that reputation you just aren't there anymore you, you don't exist to people anymore or you fail <laughs> you failed way harder than people who just aren't expected to excel fail and that's like the main thing that i think i witnessed the most in my parents generation because their generation was part of the timeline of history where immigration was opened back up after like a hundred years of um what is that word called where you just don't let people come into the country <laughs> but that happened to asians for like a hundred years and then it stopped and then my parents came and that was, yeah, the Exclusion Act and all of that. Just like a lot of legislation passed that stopped, barred a lot of Asians from coming in. But then as soon as that dropped, they wanted Asians to come and go to the, the universities and work and then basically bolster and spread the American dream and the power of America and like, wow, such a beautiful country to be in. But then um, if you aren't doing that, if you're not part of that 
whole process thing, you're just like left behind or looked at in the most terrible way. So that's the main effect that I've personally seen in model minority myth and experience to myself. I don't know if you had a different experience in Canada. <laughs> Um, I think for me, I'm going to like zoom out a little bit and just say how the model minority myth feeds into systemic racism as a whole. And in that way, obviously, yeah, it's like fucked up a lot of things for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, Asian Americans definitely benefit from that. I mean, just the fact that I can like go about my day without getting shot at by police because I don't look like I'm going to like do any harm. Um, <laughs> And then like one of the things that you mentioned when you were just answering the question is like we've, yeah, like we've managed to like gain success and all that. But I think that's also like a stereotype because Asian Americans, I think like most people, when they hear that term, they think East Asians, but that also like Asian Americans include South Asians. And when we're talking about like the income gap between East Asians and South Asians, that's like South Asians are one of the poorest people in America because a lot of them like, came here as refugees. And even, I think it was like a, a statistic that I saw that was in 2020 in New York City, one in four Asians were living in poverty. Um, so I think when we're talking about like su success, like yeah, I guess like the crazy rich Asians and like a lot of like the media portrays that, but the bamboo ceiling is definitely a thing. I mean, I, I think there's this quote that I got from Minor Feelings, which is a book by Kathy Park Hong that I had written down because I wanted to bring it up at some point, but maybe it's, this is a good time. It says, in the popular imagination, Asian Americans inhabit a vague purgatorial status, not white enough nor black enough, distrusted by African Americans, ignored by whites, unless we're being used by whites to keep the black man down. We are the carpenter ants of the service industry, the apparatchiks of the corporate world. We are math crunching middle managers who keep the corporate wheels greased, who never get promoted since we don't have the right face for leadership. Yeah. Where's that quote again? From again? Can you say? Minor, it's a book called Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. Great. Um, the model minority myth. You know, I think that it's actually just that. I think it's a myth. I don't think it's actually true. I understand that there are um, benefits that are perceived from that, but I think that it is actually something that all minorities are up against, is that when there is some kind of success, it's thought of as, oh, it's because of this other thing and not because they've like worked their ass off and actually had to be like 10 times better and at what they're doing. Um, you know, I'm also a member at this gallery in Dumbo called AIR and recently just did kind of a interview for them and talking about that history and about how the people of color who have been part of that are all these kind of like superstars, you know? It's like folks like Howardina Pendel and Anna Mendieta and it's like, well, yeah, because to be in that kind of place, the only way of like achieving that for minorities is to be in that like excellence. So I think that it's just that it's a myth and I think that the US is built on an, an infrastructure of violence that has affected people of all races and is also affecting all of us still and it's like something that we all kind of have to live and navigate within. Um, so yeah, I think it's really a myth and I think it's perpetuated this idea um, that's turned into a reality that really I personally feel that racism against Asians has been accepted for a long time until really recently. Um, so, so yeah. I guess that's it. So yeah, the model minority myth, a lot of, many of the times people might say, oh, you're so smart or you're this. It's actually not a compliment. Um, it's a stereotype and why it's harmful is also because you're placing 
one minority group as more superior against another minority group. So if there's a good minority, there has to be a bad minority. So we're really aligning to this white supremacy and you know, aligning to a standard that is created by people. So, and that's like an order of, and so I think that's what agents have to always understand that we, we all have, that's why the term BIPOC is used. Um, and there's a, one of the definitions, and there's a lot of um, people don't like the term BIPOC, people like the word BIPOC, but this is one of the definitions. Um, it's a term specific to the United States, intended to center the experience of black and indigenous groups and demonstrate solidarity between communities of color. So it's really important that um, black indigenous experience and histories are different, of course, from the other minorities' experience, but that we are in solidarity as um, POCs. And I think that's a sort of a powerful terminology for those of you who may have really not thought too much about the term BIPOC. Um, that's why I think people use it. Um, and I just wanted to clarify that, that the model minority myth is harmful for all people. Which one should I do? The third one on this list? Let me see. Which ones do y'all want to, what do you all want to talk about next? Okay, great. So the next question is, how do you respond to microaggressions that are meant to be compliments? I guess that seems like a continuation of model minority. So that makes sense. Yeah, we'll go with that one. So, yeah. Okay, I'm repeating the question. How do you respond to microaggressions that are meant to be compliments? I have a funny story. Well, it's not that funny of a story, but last week, last week I went to the hardware store in my neighborhood. I live down in Flatbush. And I went to go to look for some chains to hang up my curtain so that it was hanging lower from the wall. I don't know why I'm telling you this. But I was at the hardware store and I went in with a mission so I didn't want anyone to bother me. And so when I walked in, I looked at the, the, the guy manning the table and I gave him a really big smile and I just like directly walked to the back of the store to look for what I need to look for. And then I had headphones on and I can hear him asking me where I'm going and what I wanted, but I just like assumed that he wouldn't think that I couldn't hear him and I'd just leave me alone. But then he like hovered around me without talking for a solid 30 seconds. Like he followed me back there and hovered around me and he saw me just like scanning, scanning the shelves. And at one point I just, I didn't want once again, this is part of part of the problem. But I didn't want to make a scene or to like bring any attention, to, any more attention to myself. So I very like performatively picked up a random ass object and I started reading the back of it as if as if I wanted to know like how to use it. I think it was like a, a bottle of something, a solution of some sort. And I was just looking at the back of it and reading it and like nodding to myself. And then I put it back down and then he walked away. He saw that I can read and then he walked away. And then as I got to the cashier to check out with my stuff, he was like, your total is this, do you want a receipt? And I was like, no, I don't need a receipt, thank you. And he finally talked to me and was like, wow, I thought that you didn't know English. And I was like, I, I was born here. And he goes, oh, it's just skin. And then, and then I laughed. I kind of just like laughed because I was just, I kind of liked that he said it that way rather than any other way because I haven't heard it that way before. But it was just so interesting to me because it was just, he was another POC and I'm another, well, he's very obviously like not from here either. But we were just looking at each other and I was just like laughing at him and he laughed with me and then I was like, have a good day and then I left. So in some ways I, register the microaggression and know that it's not coming from a bad place. And so 
I try not to address them in any way that would put me in a worse place. And instead, I just react to the situation as it is, which is comedy. So <laughs> that's one instance. But in general, I think it really is important as a person who's being microaggressed to learn how to under like learn how to register when something is meant to be a compliment but doesn't feel like a compliment and how you can respond to it in a way that doesn't make you feel like you have to prove yourself suddenly you can take the compliment it was probably a compliment but then you can respond with if i can do it why can't you or if you can do it, why can't I? Oh my God, I said that backwards. <laughs> but that's kind of just my attitude in general with ma microaggressions at this point. Um, I think I read, like when it's posed as a compliment, I usually react differently depending on the person who said it. Because I think for me, I've like lived enough years in the Western world to realize like, if I would go look at you and like we've interacted a few times, I know whether you're gonna understand shit that I say or not. Like as in like, if I fight you on it, like yeah, I can tell if you're gonna like be receptive to it and be understanding that oh, like, oh, I like said something I shouldn't have or like, oh, that can come across as offensive versus people who I know are just gonna be like, why, why the fuck is that a problem? Um, I think an example would be like, I got my BFA from Pratt and first year drawing class, there was a professor during midterms, like we had like one-on-one -on -one meetings with him. And in the beginning of the semester, we had like handed in index cards with like our name, where we're from and all that. And I like right before my meeting with him is my friend who was born and raised here. She's from Connecticut. She's, yeah, and um, apparently she like comes out of the meeting like huffing and puffing and she's like, I told him like I was born here and he like the entire meeting was just him saying like, wow, your English is so good. And so I went in there already knowing what I had like coming for me. And again, he's like staring at the index card that says like from Vancouver, Canada. And he's like, your English is so good. And I'm like, yeah, I grew up in Canada. And then he like takes it a step further and is like, it's such a shame that there are so many Asian students in the class who are so good at drawing, but they don't understand English. And I'm, I was just like, I like stared at him like silently for I, I think like a good like 10 seconds. And then I just was like, you know what? I don't have the energy in me to deal with this shit today. So that time I let it slide and then <laughs> Senior year, I this was like our first assignment. We like I wrote an essay on the Rauschenberg retrospective at MoMA. This was back in like 2017, and he, the professor, gave me like email feedback saying like it was like a long ass email saying like this like this part is like amazing. You're such a good writer. Blah 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 blah. And then at the very end, he's like, it doesn't matter if you did, but can you tell me if you got help writing this paper? And then I was like, the fuck? <laughs> and so immediately, like, I reached out to, like, some of my friends in the class asking. Um, I had a Puerto Rican friend who's also a really great writer. And he was like, yeah, no, he told me that, like, he really liked my paper. And, like, he, like, specified which parts he liked. But he didn't ask me if I got help writing that. And so I was like, I'm not going to be quiet for this. So I, like... I like stirred some shit up, but yeah, I, I think for me at this point, it's become like just, it depends on whether I think that they're gonna be receptive to it or not. Well, yeah, two really different, I guess, kind of ways of thinking about it, yeah. Um, I guess I've had similar experiences on both sides of, oh, you're really good at speaking English, but then also you're really good at speaking Japanese too. And um, I guess I'm always kind of a person who's more like, oh, you know, this is a, maybe a moment to kind of break some stereotypes. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I was, uh, you know, I'm also Japanese and that's why I can speak Japanese. Or, you know, I, was, I went to American school in Asia and that's how I know English. Um, because I feel like, and maybe like you, Kathy, kind of like, you know, being 
in a country and also being educated in a different language than is like a primary language in that country, there does kind of come up, people have questions, you know, understandably. Um, so I feel like it's something that I've kind of dealt with my whole life and is always kind of a thing of like, oh, yeah, I can understand why people maybe ask me, but um, it's also kind of a thing of like, oh, this can like break those stereotypes because I think there is maybe an assumption that I am not Asian when people perceive me. So it's like kind of a moment to be able to kind of break down that, that um, assumption too, yeah. I think most of the time people don't know how to ask the right question or how to say a compliment. Mm -hmm. And I think so I don't, yeah. It, it's too tiring to get mad every time someone says something. So I just let it slide. Um, yeah, I have Japanese people telling me, oh, your Japanese is so good. I say, oh, thank you. You know, oh, your English is so good. Oh, so thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about belonging, if that's OK. Um, how do you define belonging as an Asian American? And when have you felt like you belonged or not belonged in different communities? And it could be communities of artists. Um, it could even be an SBA student when you were here, or as a New Yorker, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you need a minute? Jiwoo? Um, I think rec until recently, I've always kind of thought about the question of like where home is for me and like what constitutes home for people like us with sort of like different cultural identities. Um, I think the first time that it, I really like started thinking about it was, so I have an uncle back in Canada. He's now in his like early 50s, but at the time, he, wait, is he in his late? I think he's still in his late 40s, never mind. Um, but at the time he was like early 40s and um, I was just like, like shooting the shit with him, whatever. And then he like all of a sudden was like, do you like, doesn't it feel like you don't really have a home? And that was just like really surprising to me because he had been living in the States since he was a middle school student because he came here by himself and like he went to boarding school and all that. And then um, he's like living with a white partner now. And he's just like, he has like Korean is not fluent and He's just very much like whitewashed for lack of a better word. But so I was like not expecting him to also be going through the same struggles as me, who I think I've always been like sort of on the fence and like in between uh, places. And so then I started thinking like, wow, this is like a problem that is not gonna go away for Asian Americans or Asian Canadians, whatever. Um, and I think it was like when I came here, so I got my BFA at Pratt and then I went back to Canada for two years and then I came here in 2021 for the MFA program. And then I think it wasn't until I came here in 2021 that I really felt like I belonged anywhere because growing up, again, I was placed in like a predominantly white neighborhood. And then grade five, I moved to a neighborhood that was like heavily Asian. And so I didn't feel like I, be like I, didn't feel like I belonged to either or because with White people, you know, like, oh, you're too Asian to be white. And then with Asian people, it's like you're too whitewashed to be Asian. So it's always been like belonging slash displacement, like assimilation versus alienation that has been something that's always been on my mind. But I think in 2021, when I came here, I finally found like my group of people, like Yin, like Asian Americans who are like fluent and like comfortable with both cultures or like however many cultures that they're part of equally. Um, yeah, so I think right now I'm like really happy. I feel like I've like found myself a community of sorts where I can talk about these things and talk about identity without feeling like judged in any way. I think I also feel very similar to everything that Jiwoo just said, but I also thought about belonging in almost like the backwards way of how America and China, neither of those cultures belong to me. Just because I am not perceived by those cultures as belonging to them. And so, <laughs> and so I, 
know that I have no control over how the others perceive me and receive me, but I have control over how I feel like I can own being American or being Chinese. And a lot of that, going back to language, goes back to that part. I feel like I get a taste of belonging whenever I'm able to have a real conversation with another Chinese student or another Chinese person in my life, or when I'm able to just talk about the most random shit in English um, about American culture. Like It's when I'm able to connect and have a conversation with anybody that I'm able to connect with on that level, on a personal level, that I feel like I can belong. And similar to what you were saying, that, ex that experience and feeling is extra heightened when I feel like even the things that are unspoken about my lack of belonging is being received or empathized with by another Asian American person. And so that community in itself is like peak belonging for me. But every like, real interaction of connection and conversation with anybody also makes me feel like I can belong anywhere. And part of that is just because I don't belong anywhere. And so I can just make that my truth however I want to make it my truth. Yeah, I think belonging is a really tough thing for everybody because I feel like all of us at some point have been like disconnected from our history um, in either from like erasure or people moving or just that kind of information not being able to be accessible at any point. Um, you know, I think a lot of times I'm usually around like pretty diverse communities and I think that's when I feel the most sense of belonging like in diversity and I think New York that's such a real benefit of this city is that it is so diverse you have people from all different places but also people from all different backgrounds who are also from New York and from the US um, so I think that's kind of where I feel the most at home is like oh yeah we're all kind of just here together you know and we all can kind of like be in this present space together and it's kind of like that thing of like selected family or building your own community and feeling at home with with that um so so yeah i think it's in that kind of real diversity that you have in new york and also in other places that i feel the most maybe not belonging but at least the most comfortable I spent a little bit of time up, upstate this summer, and after a week, I was like, I have to go back. <laughs> and that's when you know, it's like, I have to go back. I, try, I thought, oh, maybe I'll retire up here. It's like, no, I have to go back to the city. Yeah, because it's a sense of belonging. It's where people don't stare at you, because you know, in these little towns, they look at you like, oh, there's an middle-aged Asian woman in our store and you have to sort of like you feel uncomfortable because they stare at you and they don't mean you know they're, they're not mean but you just don't feel like you belong because of the way they quickly look at you as soon as you walk in and stare at you like so yeah it's it's the city for me that I feel like I belong. Um, well, I think that's like a thing of New York too. It's like a place that you choose to be. <laughs> you, I feel like every day have to decide like, oh yeah, I'm gonna stay here today. <laughs> you know, at least that's how it feels like for me recently. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, I'm choosing to be here. And that's like something that I feel like bonds everybody who does choose to be here. It's like, oh yeah, you know? I mean, there are a lot of folks that have grown up here, live here, you have like generations of roots here, but a lot of people in New York come here, they choose to come here, and they choose to come here for like that reason of, um, of everything that is, that's here and all the people that are here. So yeah, maybe that's the kind of thing that bonds the people in that choice. Um, before we open up for, to their questions, I think it's real time, right, probably? Um, so the last question, I'm just going to say, based on your personal experiences, what suggestions do you have for SVA to better support AAPI students? 
I think, I mean, this panel, for, for one, I'm like super grateful that this is even happening. And I think it like says something when like, the days leading up to this, I was like texting Yin being like, I feel kind of shitty, like having people come in at 6.30, like outside of like normal class hours to sit here, listen to us talk about like our racial traumas basically. <laughs> Um, and I was like, is it going to be perceived as like us whining and all that? But I'm like, when I was in the bathroom earlier, I was thinking to myself, like, no, like the fact that I'm even feeling apologetic that this conversation is happening, like says a lot about the lack of API, like resources or like related events or whatever, not even just at SVA, but in like schools in general. Um, suggestions? Do you want to take a crack at it? I was almost just about to echo everything you just said in a different way. <laughs> but I was also just thinking like, um, I feel like especially since the pandemic began, there has been s a significant growth in voices being heard in the API community and just talking about us, finally, us just being able to talk amongst ourselves and have an audience and have other people talk about us too. Like that in general has been happening, but because this city is so saturated and so full of very, very expansive resources and like opportunities to learn that we, I feel like not to point fingers at SVA, but like we, I feel like this school might have fallen back a little bit knowing that there are other schools doing it too. You know what I mean? Like I see a lot of events for a lot of colleges in New York City and it's still happening, but it's definitely kind of tunneled down to very specific organizations and very specific groups of people doing the work still. And there's not enough like growth and exposure and expansion in that way. And I feel like, like you said, like this event is like a cute little little thing to start us off. Not to say that it's this, it began here, but <laughs> there could be more, <laughs> more events. And like, I'm very curious to hear how Asian students at SVA feel when they come here and suddenly have to deal with the culture shock and learning how to be in this city in particular with how fast and how loud it is. Plus, you're trying to be artists, which is also another huge challenge in itself. So for you to like talk about what you want to talk about in a language that you might not be as familiar with that could also become a doorway for more API discussion that isn't so focused on just like our point of view. It could be on the outside point of view of Asians as well. Does that make sense? Um, I think the way that SVA can better support AAPI students is actually a way that they could just support all students of all backgrounds is to really kind of create more spaces that students can express their own identities in their own words. Um, you know, I think there's also a real need for um, spaces to build more cross-cultural understanding. Um, and I think that it's really important that the students do that. So I think it might actually be something that, you know, there's ways that like institutions build things, but then there's also ways that like people within the institutions, which is like all of you can build things too. Um, so I also kind of like really encourage everybody in here of like, oh, if you want to kind of like create your own groups, create your own like support systems, um, this is a great place to do that because you have built in community here. Um, so I think, yeah, more platforms for everyone to really be able to express their own identity 
um, to break down a lot of the monoliths that we kind of perceive people as being. Kathy, do you have anything to add? It's a little weird when you're sort of the in leadership role, what can we do? Um, this was, Mark came to me many, many months ago and I think it evolved this, right? This, we did not know. We, I think we envisioned something different and then now we're here. And what I got from here is meeting three of you and having discussion has been great because I'm from a different department. So it's also this breaking down some of the silos within SVA to have these conversations, I think would be really, really beneficial. So, you know, thank you for that, for bringing me into the MFA space. Um, should we open up to questions? Yeah, maybe questions. And it would also be interesting to hear if any of the audience has responses to some of the questions that we've been talking mm -hmm. about too. Um, I think like ideas of microaggressions, code switching, belonging are things that like everybody can can um, identify with. So I think we can like open up, even if people don't necessarily have questions, but if mm -hmm. people just have like responses also. Yeah, any, any, any. I have a mic here, okay. Uh, I just want to, I just wanted to like address how I felt. So I'm from South Korea. I've been here for like two months or something. And uh, these days I kind of hardly like I did identify myself as an Asian. Cause like even back in South Korea, yeah, I have like a lot of friends, a lot of friends, a lot of close friends of mine was like from America. I mean, only time I perceive myself as a Korean is when I have to like check the dollar price. Cause it's really, anyway. So like, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's like how I felt. Cause for, for first week I was kind of freaked out because before I come here, I heard a lot of news about Asian getting attacked, Asian getting jumped. So I was like a little nervous, scared. And then I realized in this city, like everybody's scared and everybody's nervous. Nobody wants to go out in the night or midnight. So like for myself, like I kind of hardly, you know, I hardly think about like Asian or stuff. That that just like, I mean, I'm also not that smart, so. That's, what, that's how I feel. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, I'm Hyunjun. Hyunjun. I mean, it's hard to pronounce it. I actually have sort of like a response to that, or just, just like my two cents, is that I think like when we were talking about what this pan, what we wanted this panel to be, like the reason that we decided to include the topic of microaggression is because I think when you first enter like the Western world, you think racism is basically people calling you a chink on the street or like doing like the slanty eye gesture. But, and like that is direct racism, but then there's also racism in the form of microaggression or like people, like what we talked about earlier, like sort of like backhanded compliments basically. So I think like as you spend more time in America, like you start to pick up on those slights and you realize like, oh, like, hey, I thought my first year in New York, I didn't experience any racism, but thinking back now, that was racist. Hi, hey y'all. It's good to see you. Um, I have two kind of questions. I think Jibu, you touched on both of them, but I'm interested to hear what everyone else thinks. Um, the first one was um, like thinking about the categorization of like Asian or Asianness. Um, it's like a really broad swath of like the world population, and so I'm curious if you think, Jibu, like I said, you mentioned it a little bit, but like if the model minority myth you feel is like evenly applied across the like Asian diaspora or like Asian identities, I guess. Um, and like why you think that is or like what is different. Um, and then my second question was, 
um, a question about like connecting the model minority myth as an example, like ways that we can connect like anti-Asian sentiment with like broader like colonial oppression and like what you think about the way the model minority myth like props up proximity to whiteness or like props up um, like anti-blackness as a concept. Like how can we connect this conversation to like a broader experience of like race in America or colonial ideas, I guess. I think for the first half of the, or the first question about the non-East Asian Asians, um, I feel like the more insidious part of model minority myth is the fact that it does erase the Asians that don't fit into it from the minds of the people that think about this myth or like have it as a mindset of theirs or a stereotype that they believe in. And so, wait, I just lost. I'm so sorry. And so that has also been a part of the work, I think, for Asian Americans to consider when we talk about these things, how much of what we're saying is even an accurate representation for ourselves of our group, of, of our perceived groups and communities. And then in response to the second half of that question, it was the anti-blackness and the pitting of minorities against each other being a, like a, a sub thing of this myth. Um, I'm gonna need someone to take it away. I'm blanking. <laughs> Sorry. Like off the top of my head, I don't know how to answer that in terms of what we can do as like Asian Americans. I feel like for that to end and like interminority racism to even see an end, like low key, that's all white people. Like <laughs> literally, white people need to acknowledge that they are the ones that are like doing the pitting against like different minorities and they need to acknowledge systemic racism and like it like that I feel like is out of our hands at this point but obviously like we can we I mean that's a loaded question yeah I don't want to like say like I don't want to like take not take responsibility as an Asian American be like, oh, like, is there any, anything that even I can do? But I don't know, did, did you? <laughs> well, I think maybe the first question of like, who is afforded being considered in that myth, I think is something that is definitely true, that it's not something that is um, afforded to, to everyone who consider or consider themselves as Asian or AAPI. Um, I think even within that, there's kind of a unsaid colorism that happens even within that myth of it's something that may be afforded more to white Asians than, um, than darker Asians. Um, and I think that it's a similar myth um, that has been that parallels kind of categories that have been put on other races, even though it has different kind of connotations to it. Um, I think that you're right, that it's like all kind of in, from like this place of colonialism, you know, that they're all kind of like steps away from maybe in the US, this kind of perceived whiteness that they're thinking of as like the majority of this country. Um, I think that there are ways that that is being fought against. You know, I think historically there's been a lot of support between the Asian and the black communities. Um, and I think that that's something that's really important for like all of us to keep doing and keep like not letting even our own perceptions of what we are to 
mean like, oh, I can only support like Asian, Asian kind of like efforts. It's like, no, we have to support each other, you know, and that means like showing up for each other. That means like speaking up for each other too. Um, so I think it's like a big question that you're asking, but I think it's an important question that we have to keep asking ourselves of like, where can we actually dismantle those, mm, what's the word? Those like, um, I guess perceived categories, not perceived categories. What's the word Hierarchies. I'm for? Say that? Hierarchies? Maybe not hierarchies, just those like stereotypes. You know, it's like, how can we keep like dismantling that um, and keep kind of like just dismantling all of those racial myths that are not necessarily, not anything that anybody aspires to, but something that has been put on people. Um, and maybe also recognizing that, that it's like, there are these labels that have been put on people and how can we actually just kind of like see each other for individuals versus like, these kind of stereotypes that are really meant to divide people. Good question though. Thanks, Jonathan. Other comments and questions? Um, first of all, thank you all so much. I'm really glad that this talk happened. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about these kinds of issues um, as a white American who spent, as many, uh, as many of you know, um, I spent 10 years teaching in Asia um, and then made the decision to move back to the US um, with a Hong Konger husband and two mixed race babies. And I, I think a lot about raising my two kids here in this country. Um, their, their dad is overseas. And so I'm kind of in a situation now where I'm the white parent trying my best to make sure that my kids will feel connected to you know, their Chinese culture and, um, you know, to their language. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, I don't know, it's just something that's on my mind all the time and I feel like there's tremendous responsibility there. Do any of you have any words of advice for someone who is raising Asian American kids in this country? I don't have an answer, but I raised an Asian American kid in this country. She's in her early 20s. Um, I try my best. I mean, I sent her to Japanese school on weekends that she hated, hated. But then we were just having a conversation the other day and she said, oh, I wish I could speak Japanese better. You know, she was forced to do it and she, you know, and then she kind of blamed it a little bit on me. Like, why didn't you speak to me more in Japanese and et cetera. But it's, it's just trying your best. And, you know, she, um, just, it's, there's no perfect way. There's no perfect. And you just continue to have these conversation with your children and, and try to expose them. But there's only so much you can do living in the United States and raising an Asian, you know, child, but um, and this is a little off topic, but she also said that as a mixed race person, she also has her own microaggressions and comments and people saying, oh, you're so lucky you're, you know, half white, half Asian. And she finds it very offensive because that's what, everywhere she goes, um, but she doesn't quite know how to respond to that. And I think your children might face that too, people commenting on their fair skin, but exotic look, you know, um, it's, <laughs> and it's, it's true that happens. So um, just something, you know, it's just something to be very, very like open and having a conversation with them all the time. And it's, we're not perfect.
don't want to add anything for him. No? Kun? I don't Hi, know, uh, my name is Kun from South Korea. And I um, apologize I'm, why I'm standing here. I hurt my shoulder and back, so it's quite difficult to sit sit the long times so I'm so sitting. I came to New York 2018, it's almost uh, nine years. Uh, so my experience as an Asian woman in New York is quite more physical violence I had uh, experience, I have been experienced. So that, it started the first year, I, I came to 2018 fall, and it started fall. So I, someone pushed me in Manhattan, in near here, and I fall down and in raining day and daytime and among many, many pupils. I already mentioned this several times in, to you, so I'm sorry to mention again here. But, uh, and then so far, except years in COVID, because I was uh, locked in my house, so I, don't, I didn't have any experience. So mostly three years, I have quite several experience. So some physical violence, uh, so many verbal, uh, verbal threaten in Subway and some even McDonald. It's, it's not only from men, it's sometimes from women. It's, it looks stronger than me. So uh, the, uh, I think that the violence against the women is in everywhere in the world. In, even in Korea, is the most one of the most safest country in the world. But problem is in here, I feel I feel it's kind of a, mm, too difficult to say to people. Is I have a very passive attitude making public. Because I don't know why, I, I, I'm still thinking, maybe the, I don't have any uh, platform, but my school is uh, special. I really, really appreciate uh, my school, SBA and Mark. We are very open, and we are uh, open ear to hearing. But I'm thinking, after graduation, I'm going to out of the school. There is uh, no platform, and then, so I really agree with you that we need uh, some platform or some community to pop making public. So that is the first way to solve this problem. It's, yeah, announce this, my experience. So, but, but I'm, I'm not Asian American. I'm just Asian, I'm foreigner here. So I'm wondering, you live a long time here, and so you think uh, the, any community is getting raising or some any effort to making some platform to community for some Asian American? I'm, I'm wondering, yeah. There are, I'm, there are a lot of cultural centers in New York for um, just migrants, Culture, like migrants from outside of America, like Japan society, Korea society, and Taiwan society, like all of the different Asian societies. And then in general for safety, there's definitely also a lot of like student, not student, grassroots and like community run organizations that help elders and younger people get home safe. There's like the, what's it called? Uh, Guardian and Angel is one of the organizations. If you if you are getting home late at night, you can call them and they will walk you home from the from the subways and all of that. And that's only one. I'm pretty sure there's like a handful of other organizations that really do prioritize making people feel safe when they are out on the streets, just because of how crazy it's getting during the last couple of years. Um, and yeah, I agree. I feel like just telling people about our experiences, no matter how sad or angry you felt in those moments is already in itself another action step that you can take to help yourself down the line feel safer. And a lot of people will probably have similar experiences and relate to you and want to work with you to find resources as well and make resources for others but yeah that's my two cents thank 
you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your story because sometimes, you know, people who are victims feel like they're ashamed or somehow it's their fault and it's not, you know, it's not at all. So thank you for sharing. And we all learn from your stories. So, and what we can do is to, you know, um, if you ever see something, right? Like you have to step in and people don't step in, but I think more and more people are in New York, which is really comforting. Um, you hear these stories of people who are, you know, getting harassed or pushed and people protecting and that's, a good thing so thank you for sharing i also wanted to say like outside of like i guess more for, like practical resources if you just like want someone to talk to and like unload your feelings because i know like when things like that happen you kind of want to feel validated about your experience and like how you felt about it if you like don't have asian american friends or friends that are i guess a little bit more sensitive to those issues. Like, we're friends on Instagram. You can always reach out to me. I'll listen to you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry to hear that that has happened. And also, unfortunately, not surprised because I feel like every single one of my like friends and family who is like perceived as Asian in the past couple years has had violence enacted against them. And I think you're right, particularly women. Um, I think that there are a lot of resources that have come out because of the past couple years. Um, I don't know if you remember Allison. I don't think you were here when Allison Quo was here, but she's all really involved in a lot of um, a lot of great organizations that are that are um, really supporting like Asian women. I think one is called Wow. W dot O dot W. Um, what? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, how Kathy is saying too, of um, us and maybe kind of like for all people to kind of like, you know, there's ways of like stepping in. There's also kind of like public classes that you can take about, um, you know, diffusing those kinds of situations because you also don't want to put yourself in a situation that might be dangerous for you. So there are also like New York City resources that you can tap into or classes that you can take about like um, diffusing those kind of like public situations. Um, and yeah, maybe that's also something that SVA could do is host something like that. So we could all kind of um, become better, better um, neighbors to each other. Any other comments, thoughts? Uh, thank you all for your talk first and foremost. Um, I had a question. Uh, growing up, a lot of my first generation friends, we, we're very open in the South about race and things like that. So we were pretty open about just like growing up. And a lot of them expressed to me that their parents growing up, they would not want them to date or hang out with black kids. Um, but they could, they could date white kids, they could hang out with white kids. Do you think that touches more on the assimilation aspect or is that more of a deeper reach into colorism across cultures or what do you feel that the root of that comes from? I think you kind of answered your own question, but yeah, I think it's a combination of white supremacy, um, people aligning with whiteness as being successful and many immigrants maybe believing that, that that is the key to success and that's what they take, tell their children when there's really no truth in that at all. Um, I think there's a lot of, yeah. Um, and I think it, it probably, if your friends told you that really happened, but it's, it's again, it's the systemic, systemic racism. That's why we all have to sort of fight against that rather than these individual, um, conflicts between races and especially um, minorities that we all have to sort of speak up to that together rather than point fingers at each other because 
there's it's it's power it's you know it's capitalism it's um that we're kind of fighting against and speaking if and we when we know what what we see is the problem and naming it it gives us power right because um you say well that sounds like you know white supremacy and aligning yourself to power it's aligning yourself to um capitalism and um I think that's important that we all get educated and we all sort of help each other. And even even amongst your friends, if even if you have friends who like even say these casual jokes about race, you know, you have to be able to say something, even though they may say, oh, you're no fun. Right. It was only a joke. It's there's there are no jokes. They're all racist jokes. There's you know, there's nothing funny about um, excluding a group of people. So I think that's something that we all should really, really work towards, I think, together. Yeah, I think you said it. I think it's, you know, there's ideas that um, of white supremacy and colorism and also cultural appropriation in ways that manifest really differently in different places around the world. And in my experience, um, in a lot of like mainstream Asian culture, there is this kind of like pursuit of whiteness that is aligned with success. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm also a person who like, my mom's side of the family is all Asian, all Okinawan, and my dad's side of the family is super diverse. And, you know, my father was kind of like the first person to kind of cross that and definitely was something that was really difficult for my mom's family to accept. It was kind of like a thing like, this is like being very honest, but this is like, you know, 1960s in Japan where they met and it was this thing of like, oh, if you're going to marry a foreigner, they, uh, they better be like a white foreigner. And my dad definitely was not, you know? So it took, honestly, my mom's side of the family a little while to accept that and to accept him and it took him actually like assimilating to their culture of like learning how to speak Japanese and like going through like all of these steps of like a kind of like marriage proposal and something that actually wasn't accepted until like I actually came along and then they were like oh, okay I guess he's here to stay we gotta we gotta deal with this now you know um and now is something that my um, mom's side of the family is much better for, you know? But it was something that was honestly really hard for them um, and took them a lot of unlearning things that they had actually been taught to deny about like their own culture um, and assimilation that they were forced to do, kind of brought in from like mainland Japan. Um, but I think you're, it definitely is, you know, the ideas of colorism, ideas of racism are prevalent and manifest in really different ways around the world. Um, yeah, do y'all have, want to add anything? Also to begin with, Asian parents are racist as fuck. Like I'm just gonna say that. Sometimes it's not even a matter of like, don't date a black person. It's like, don't date outside of you're no don't date outside of your race yeah and like I'm, a disclaimer in case like my mom decides to youtube and like watch this i'm not saying like my family was like that in any way but like i definitely have friends who are like korean and they're dating like a chinese person or a japanese person and they're like no like date a korean girl or date a korean guy and i think a large part of it like yeah it is racism but also just language fluency and just like being able to be comfortable, like inviting someone into your family that they can relate with on the cultural level and just like baseline talk to. I haven't formed a very solid question yet, but on the tangent of citizenship, my parents are thinking about joining me to this great American dream journey. Um, <laughs> They were like interested in just see how they will live in another country, considering the political tyranny they're experiencing. Um, I guess just if you guys have any thoughts on like 
like thinking about your experience living with a parent who um, might not be as fluent in English as you are, who might have a different life experience as you, that they have different social belonging as you. Like, how do you, how, how is that like in a household? Okay, well, my parents weren't really around. They were just working the entire time they stepped foot in America because they really believed in that American dream. And my family background is we are that Chinese family that opens the Chinese takeout in a town with no other real Chinese food. So we are the token Chinese in that area. And then once that lifts off, we moved to a different town and opened another Chinese supermarket or whatever. But that has led them to really find their own purpose here and distract them kind of from all of those social obstacles that they might have had to address. But this is also a different time. This was like the 90s and the early 2000s. Right now, it's kind of hard to avoid addressing who you are when you're outside. But um, I think your comfort is going to end up being a huge source of what's it relief for them if they were to come here even if they weren't as comfortable as you are because of the language, knowing that you are safe and comfortable is already going to be a huge source of relief for them because I feel like that was what happened with my parents. They knew that even though they are constantly working and not really home and not really around, they are setting up a foundation for their children to be good. And then now that they're retired, they immediately left. <laughs> They immediately left and is like just traveling the world as much as they can and just stopping by for a little bit at a time. But I just, yeah, there's no way for you to like prepare them for America in any way. But reassurance and confidence in yourself is going to go a long way, I think. Very good, good job, Yen. I'm going to go back here. Did anyone else want to say anything before I? Okay. Did you still have a question? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for providing for this, this panel. I think it's wonderful to have this kind of conversation. Um, I think the inherent like racial triangulation that happens with model minority is something that you guys touched upon. And um, I know that you guys are talking about um, the solutions, and I think that um, my question is, I, I think Aya was talking about how it has to come from us. We can't depend on the, the white people to fix it, because then we're going to have the same problems as the LA riots, where they just watch the minorities fight each other. Um, my question is, why do you think that the different types of Asian groups, like the Koreans, Japanese, or the Chinese, I don't see a concerted effort by these major organizations that are supposed to be the spearheads in America, like Japan Society, Korea Society, doing joint efforts to try to bring unity, to try to, to have that open conversation. Why do you think that is? This might be kind of a dumb answer so I'm apologizing in advance, but those three countries are not unified in any way. <laughs> so for us to come here to unify is kind of just hard to say in general, right? But then again, like if you were to focus on like the Asian American, like just the things that connect us and the purpose of these organizations to provide safety and belonging and resources for 
the people here. Um, your concern is extremely valid, but I am not sure how I personally can address that. I don't know if you guys can. Um, I think you're right that there's, you know, this kind of like, I feel like it's almost a thing with a lot of organizations that are based on kind of like a specific identity, that it's almost kind of like a thing that is about defining that one specific thing versus like trying to find similarities between it. But I agree with you that there needs to be more connection there. And I agree with you too, Yin, that it's like, yeah, in those countries, there is like a lot of, a lot of tension, you know, but also we have an opportunity because we're like not in those countries. You know, again, we're like all choosing to be here. That is like, can there be something that is ways of like crossing over, crossing that over more? You know, I feel like it maybe happens more in folks that are in the US for a while or people who are like second generation that they kind of are that kind of like distancing from maybe that the country and forms like this new identity that is trying to find similarities. Why they do that, I don't know. I have to think it has to be something to do with money that it's like funding, you know, that it's like, oh, it's like maybe there's like funding from specific boards that are about like, oh, this is about like Japanese culture, this is about Korean culture. Um, but why, I'm not exactly sure. But, um, but I agree with you that there needs to be more ways of like breaking down those differences. This is just a thought, but I also feel like we're still trying to get people to know more about the history of each country's immigrants and the trials and tribulations that they have experienced that are so different than other other Asian countries. Like Japanese Americans definitely experience something way different than Chinese Americans and Korean Americans. And so to organize that and to be able to focus on that is the first priority, I think, at the moment. And to come together is like we're not there yet. <laughs> We haven't gotten there yet because people don't even know about the internment camps. People don't even know about the exclusion acts. People don't even know about like so much of the history of violence that has been erased because of the model minority. <laughs> I think we also have really different experiences depending on like where we are situated in the country. Like we always talk about how like I'm a coastal Asian and that's way different from her growing up in middle America. Yeah, and then also being like your first experience being in America, being in New York, that's also a different experience. Kathy, did you have anything or? Oh. No, that those organizations are all funded by corporations. Um, they're funded by, you know, I can only speak for Japan society, but many, many years ago, I had an interview with the president there. I don't even know what position it was. Maybe it was like head of education or something, but he didn't see me as Japanese for sure. and. Maybe there are other reasons why I didn't get the job. I'm glad because I'm here, but um, it's 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 more a representation of money and you know the corporate sponsorship. And it, they don't they're not thinking on wider terms of being in America. They're more about here we are promoting our arts and culture from the home country here, and they're more like a spokesperson. So their goal is not about uniting you know, Asians, for sure. Um, I beg to differ. There's quite a lot of, historically within um, uh, New York City itself, there's an arts organization of Japan called Basement Workshop that was started sometime in the late 60s. Um, when we look into that, Asian, uh, Chinese, Japanese, American, but again, I just suggested these were second generation, third generation, and they were artists. And they were the alternatives to a group organization like Chinatown Planning Council, CCBA, Chinese, Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, and groups like that. So the artists are the ones that, and there was, they had an organization, they had um, this woman by the name of uh, Nobu, um, 
Nobuko uh, Miyamoto, uh, Charlie Chin, and Chris Ajima. Um, and they still are alive. Well, actually, two are still alive. Um, Chris passed away a few years back, but he taught in Hawaii after becoming a lawyer and then going to Hawaii. So if you look in the basement workshops, some of the stuff that's there, um, they were doing a cultural festival that since 1979 that I know of that I used to also help out. Um, and it's continuing on still. Um, Korean, Vietnamese, South Asian, um, Afghan, not Afghan, Israel, Afghan, I should say Malaysia, whatever, East Asia, uh, West Asia, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of history of that, but you just don't know about it because people don't tell you about it. But you look up, in fact, you know, I don't know if people know that uh, Nobuko was in the film West Side Story. She played a Puerto Rican in that um, 1961 film. Um, so these, there are people out there you just don't know, but again, it's the artists that help coalesce organizations like you suggested, Japan Society, Korea Society, whatnot. There's support from other groups, but it's not as pronounced as it is because they have their own, as you say, agenda, financing, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Can you just repeat the name of that organization one more time? Called Basement Workshop, but I think right now it's the Fung Fei Chang. Fei Chang was one of them. There's also an organization called AFI, Asian Americans for Equality. They're based down on Norfolk Street. They've also been involved around the same time, and they broke off from, from basement, but they're more political, they're more active. Are involved in, um, as well as community stuff and whatnot. And there are lots of other groups like this, Asian women groups that are still Asian American writers, um, lots of them. Um, there's a woman named um, Minerva Chu that does this um, a weekly um, um, listing of all these different events that involve East Coast, West Coast, as well as all the different communities. So if you want, I could send you that email, the link, and then you could just sign on to it. That's why I learned about this. Thank you. Because yeah, thank you for sharing that. And we'll love that resource. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I think that we're kind of coming up on time. Uh, I just wanted to once again thank Kathy, Yin, Jiwoo, and Aya. Uh, it's been a real pleasure meeting with you guys over the last couple of months. Um, and I hope that we continue this conversation. Um, and thank you guys all for coming tonight. Okay.